There we go. Backwards. So populations versus random sampling. We're looking to see if the population and the sampling, right, if the details from each allow us to make inferences, make evaluations about, I looked at a, a sample this big, the population is huge, are they relatable? And like we just said, I'll ask again, let's say the exact same thing again. Okay. If I'm looking for the income of dairy farmers, what, and that's my population, actually that's the question about my population, then what is the sample that I should avoid? Who Cereal. would have no input about that? Cereal mascots. Cereal mascots. Who else do we say? NFL players. Cereal NFL players? players? Okay. Base players I heard before. Lawyers? Vegans? No, they don't know anything. They may not know much, and if I take that sample, actually I'll say the population is the United States dairy farmers. So you have to look and see if the statistic you are trying to measure, uh, the measure of the sample, well, statistic, measure of the sample to estimate a corresponding measure of a population. You have to make sure that it's reasonable. This is about making arguments or discounting something, like we saw yesterday. Nicholas Cage, movies, does not correlate to people falling into pools. Even if, you know, we had some graphs that kind of look the same. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is how we're going to break apart and get a little bit more refined with seeing if something is um, skewed data or biased data. Okay. So the statistic is just what is being measured in the sample. Measure the sample does make a corresponding measure of the population. A parameter, and this is getting nitty gritty, because parameter, it's a measure of the population that we are interested in. It's the what. It's not the how much, right? It's not actually uh, how much dairy farmers make. It's um, what is the income of dairy farmers? What's the average income of dairy farmers? You see the difference? So you might say, before we'd say, well, if we get the answer, I'm going to say the answer is the average for a dairy farmer is, you know, $85,000. But the $85,000 is actually another segment. We're going to have to separate those two things. Because I want to just be able to look just at the parameter and see if the sample I'm drawing from is going to even give me information about the parameter. Forget about the, the, actual, um, the actual outcome, the statistic of interest we're looking for. Okay. So when we have a population versus a sample, we're talking about the mean for each of them. And we have to have different symbols, otherwise, you know, I'd say, what's the mean? You'd say, you'd say, what do you mean? <laughs> I thought of it, I considered saying it, and I went for it. It was good. It being, like, kind of good is actually funnier than it being good. So, for population, we're talking about mean, we're using mu, right? I want to clarify and make sure it's not an M. And part of that is my drawing quickly on the board. I kind of do like that really quick. But we're going to even put more of a tail on the left because this is the Greek symbol mu. So I want you all to really refine that. If you're making more of an M, I want you to drop that tail on the left. Make it more of mu. Okay. No, don't even say it. Huh? Okay. Stop. Stop. Population, when we're talking about standard deviation, we're talking about sigma. Okay, we've been dealing with this. These are the ones we know because we're drawing conclusions about the population. We've only been focused on that one part. Okay. But when we're talking about the sample, we have something new here. We have the X bar. And I'd like for you actually to pull up the slip that I gave you. And I meant to above or right above the X that's in the uh, parenthesis here. You see X bar is one of the vocab words. So if you're at home and you don't have this sheet, um, right here, x bar, we're going to put a 1, excuse me, a bar over that x. x bar is the mean for the sample. So the sample, when we're talking about that, we're talking about that x bar. Okay. There's going to be some difference between the two, and actually that's going to be like the next lessons here to use that information to see if it's applicable to make that inference. All right, the standard deviation for a sample is just denoted by s. Sample S. So just remember, you can think of it this way. We've pretty much been getting all the details on these uh, these values, you know, about the population. Now we're just refining it. We got to split them up so we can compare. So 
I want to come back to the honors in a moment. If you guys can hold your anticipation and excitement. Uh, let's go down. Inference. It's a conclusion reached upon a basis of evidence and reasoning. Okay. So when you were looking at uh, iPhone sales <clears throat> versus falling downstairs, right? Were there some reasoning arguments that were possible? Right? As more iPhones get out there, more people are texting. Right? And maybe they don't watch where they're walking. Okay. So that would be an example of reasoning that would show that inference. But more than likely, iPhone sales and falling down stairs are very, very weakly correlated. Maybe there's one instance where that's happening. Okay. There's other things. Those are just two, two graphs that happen to line up, but it doesn't mean that it's causal. Very, very, very low correlation between that. All right. So this is the conclusion we're trying to make, and we're seeing, is this inference true or not? Is it reasonable? Representative sample, this is just the sample that represents, um, is representative of the population. Thus, you can infer data using proportions. So, you know, if I said, um, I'm going to take my, fourth, my fifth and sixth periods, find out how many people have an A in that class. That's probably a good sample if I'm going to look at the population of all my classes, right? The sixth period is math three, you guys are math two, excuse me. Excuse me. You guys are math three plus. So if I got, um, if I found the, the statistic for how many A's we had in here, then I'd be able to relate that to my total population. You see, so when we're looking at representative sample, it just means that your sample is a good choice to reflect the larger trend with the population. And that's where the next lessons are about bias, um, a biased sample. And that's just looking at, is it a representative sample? Really, if you look closely at that, there's even another level next to that. So um, I'll give you a choice. Do you want to do example one, which has sample and population, or do you want to do the, the summation problem? What do you think? Raise your hand if you want to just go to example one right here. Okay, raise your hand. Okay. Raise your hand if you want to do example two with summations. Summations? Sure. Sure. Raise your hand if you don't care and you'll do whatever. We... That's most people. Are you saying it's teacher's choice? Yes. Are you saying that I shouldn't ask your choice? Can you give you as many choices? Sometimes. Sometimes. That's true. All right. What is the difference? What is the difference between finding sigma and finding our s? What's the big difference you see? Good. I saw that. Sonia, you going to say that? Good. The denominator within the root is negative my, n minus 1 here, and it's just n up here. Okay. So the um, explanation of this would take about as long as the lesson. So what we did on Edmodo, um, I put a really informative Khan Academy video. It's about 15 minutes long, talking about the difference between that. I would like you to watch that uh, tonight. Okay. Question, Jackson. Um, just to clarify, the i at the bottom of uh, both of those, that's not imaginary numbers. Correct. That is not imaginary numbers. Uh, it is not an imaginary number. The information that comes around the sigma symbol, this is sigma. We, wait a minute. I thought this was sigma. This is lowercase sigma. This is just the uppercase sigma. Okay, that's why. But when you say sigma, you're talking about summations. These are called summations. Okay, maybe uh, you got to write that. Summation. So this is the summation. And with summations, all you're doing, all you're doing is, in fact, I'll do a really easier, I'll do an easy example here. So let's say we have this set of numbers. One, two, three. Real easy example. One, two, three. And my n for that, the number of terms, three. I, when they say i is equal to one, all that's saying is we're going to start our summation. What does summation sound like? As Prefix of it. So, so we're talking about addition. Wait, I gotta make sure it's addition. Addition. <laughs> they want there to be multiplication. So. And it's mirrored. So. so we're saying we're gonna start with the first number in our in our set here. Good. Now if this was an easy function, this is a little more complicated, I admit. 
But if we had an easier function that would say x minus 1, all we're doing is we're finding the answers for uh, evaluating 1, and we're adding it to the answer to um, the sum of, excuse me, the difference here of evaluating 2 and the difference of evaluating 3. So let's see what we get. If I plug in 1 right here, plug in 1, really, let's just make it into a line here. Summation of i is equal to 1, 3 here. It's going to be 1 minus 1. Oh, this is cool. <laughs> ah, cool. It's a summation, guys. Nobody stop me. It's a summation. I saw the zero and thought, oh, times that you were you could all end up being zero. Wrong. All right. So what do we get up uh, get for this difference? Zero plus one plus two. So our answer is three. The summation i is equal to one um, with three a three value for our n of x minus one is equal to three. All the summation is, it's almost like you didn't know what this was. Factorial. It's a new symbol. It's not just excitement about four, it's factorial. So once you learn that, you can start to apply this idea to with a little greater depth. And that's what we need to do for this problem. So let me go and pull the computer over there real quick. Who's seen summations before? Okay. is oh. hydraulics. Here we go. So find S. So we know we're looking at the sample. We're looking for the standard deviation of the sample A question. Is it about the lesson? So when you were just showing us the summation for the sample like one, two, three, you got one minus one plus two minus one plus three minus one. Where did the you know, deviation of x minus 1, where did the 1 to x minus 1 come from? Did that come from the data set, or did it come from i equal 1? Or did it come from where does the minus 1 come from? Yeah. That was the function I was given. Maybe your function there, maybe your function is this, right? It could be anything. Any function, you can have a summation around. This could be the summation, i is equal to 1 uh, of 5, and you have five, 5 numbers. Okay, so it doesn't come from the i equal 1. No. Okay. Good question. I see now. Absolutely good question. It can have any function here. I would evaluate for one, find my sum, or find my evaluate that, and then add that to evaluating for two, and so on. Okay. So it is a process you can use. In some cases, you need a calculator for help. Uh, sometimes you won't need it. Uh, if you do have a TI-83, 84, uh, find those functions. Get used to using them. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. All right, so we're finding S, the standard deviation for the sample, for the following sample test scores. Okay. So in looking at this, um, our N value, N is equal to 4 because there's 4 in our set. Let's see. So the standard deviation is equal to the summation. N is equal to 4. I is equal to 1. And we look, our equation for this sample standard deviation is, um, well, it's going to be whatever value for x we're plugging in minus x bar squared, all of that over n minus 1. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and first find my x bar. Let's see. How do we find the average again of uh, four numbers? Add them up. I think that gets us to 20. So x bar is 5. Okay. So we have our sample mean, our x bar. So now I can go in. Now I can go in and just input that. This is the baby step. Okay, so I evaluated for my n value, which was 4. That's where that information comes in handy. Anywhere you saw an n, you've got to put that in there. Got to evaluate it. Uh, 4 minus 1, we're going to get 3 on the bottom. I inputted, evaluated my. Uh, x bar was 5. So this is where it gets interesting. 
we're going to go ahead and for this step, we don't no longer draw or write out all this summation notation. Here, what we're going to do is evaluate one at a time. Three, then four, then six, and seven, adding all those together. The summation is only applied to the numerator, so I'm going to go in and put in three minus five squared plus four minus five squared plus squared plus. All over. That's just a little bit of work right there. Find those differences, square them. We'll find our s pretty quick. So let's go ahead and just bring it over here. 3 minus 5, negative 2 squared, 4 plus. 4 minus 5, negative 1 squared, 1. 6 minus 5, 1 squared, 1. 7 minus 5 is 2 squared is 4. Over 3. So the sample standard deviation, our s value, is in, it's going to end up being 10 over 3 rooted. s is 3.33 rooted. s is 3.3 square root 3.33 is 1.82 done not super painful right it's almost like you learn what the function does and then you're just repeating it and adding them together okay so if it was the summation of the entire fraction then each of these would be divided by 3 but it's only applied to the numerator, so I leave them there, and at the end, take the square root. Okay? Was that, that was less painful than you thought, right? Okay. No. More painful? The pain tolerance? Yes? Where did you get the 20 from? The four. Here. Sorry. What I did was 3 plus 4 plus 6 plus 7. 10, 10, 20. So it's just finding the average. You add together the, the entries, you divide by the number of entries. So that's just like finding a straight average. Okay. Uh, thumbs up, sideways, down for summations. You know it now. Okay. It's side or up. You got to execute it a couple times. Okay. And you will. Excited about that. Okay. Let's do this, and this is very similar to what you'll see in the classwork and homework. Again, we're going to break it into smaller parts than you may think is necessary, but it is going to allow us to, again, see if that inference is correct or reasonable. All right, let's read it. A. All right. There we go. A sample from period two, my period two, had three out of 20 students with an A. So that's my sample. Okay, it's a smaller group. Assume this is a representative sample of three three-plus classes. How many three three-plus students got an A? So again, I'm using one of my classes, seeing how many A's I got. I had in that class. How many students had A's? And I want to see how many A's. Um, I want to infer and find out the statistics for how many A's did I have in all my classes. So you're going to have to identify a lot. When you identify, just make sure you're as, as specific as possible. So what was my sample? Somebody describe the sample. And again, just the sample, not what the sample's statistic was. That's next. Just what's my sample? Where am I pulling? Number of students with A's and number of students. Okay, okay. Um, where did I draw this? Where did I draw the sample? What you're trying to find there is actually more so about the population, the statistic you're going for for all of them. So where did I, what sample did I actually? There we go. How many kids are in period two? One. Okay. So I'm going to go, my sample is period two, that's 20 students. Now, it wasn't that it's 20 students and three of them got A's, because where does that piece of information go? 
that's going to be in my sample statistic. Now what, I know this is who was involved in the sample or what, and then the statistic is 3 out of 20 received days. <coughs> so far so good? Just breaking it up piece by piece. Now going to population. What is the population? Good. So it's all, even more specific than 170, but it's all 33 plus students, and that's 170. All 33 plus, 170 students. Now, the parameter, that's kind of the new, that's slightly new for us, I think. Measure of the population that we are interested in. What are we trying to measure? It's the what? Students who got an A, right? Students, uh, let's say with A's. Someone say, where's the math in this? I wanted to hear that, so I'll say. Uh, <laughs> the statistical, the statistic of the interest, statistic of interest. The statistic of interest is what I'm actually trying to find. Like, why did we even do all this? What were we trying to prove? What was going to come from this? And we already know that if it is a representative sample, if it represents the population well, then you can infer data using a proportion. Okay, That's what we're going to do right now, proportion. So with this, to find the statistic of interest, I'm going to go ahead and look. I'm going to look and see that. <clears throat> what was my ratio for period two A's? Three out of 20. Now, if the sample and the population are related, and I can make that argument and reason that argument with evidence, then what I'm going to end up on this side, with this side, is 170 are my total students in my population. And I just want to know, it's going to be proportional to those number of students. So if it had been 50%, 10 out of 20, then it would be whatever, 170, um, 85. It would be 85. Okay, but in this case, it's 3 out of 20. So how are we going to solve this? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, 20x, and that was uh, 510. 20x equals 510. Divide it out. Uh, oh. oh. Twenty-five point five. How many students? So twenty-five point five is the statistic of interest that I got. Twenty-five point five. But remember that we're talking about people. Remember we're talking about statistics in general. So there may you may end up with partials, partial values here, continuous data that you need to do some reasoning around. So if I were to put all one hundred and seventy tests on the wall, how many papers? How many tests would have A's on them? Twenty-five students with A's in all three, three plus. Twenty-five. You don't round up. You don't round up. Just because, remember, even with uh, normal distribution, right? Normal distribution is a model that data is going to be based on. We're going to draw conclusions from that using our z-scores, all that method we were using, right? But it's never perfect. Even if you... Um, you know, took IQs for everyone in the world. It would be really, really close to a bell curve, but you know, there's going to be a little variation, a little bit of error in there. And that's going to happen too with statistics when we're relating between a sample which is smaller than the population. We're going to get an approximation of within the population how many students have this. You see what I mean? Okay. 
So just because stats in general are relating a smaller group to a larger group, when we get a partial, we're going to go with 25. All right, summations took a little longer than usual, but that's all we needed. So uh, have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. Be ready to play with the game day. Fun tomorrow.